The bird king Cerulean of Laguna returned to his beloved Queen Florine of Aoni in the fortress town in the land of Cal. They returned to Aoni together by carriage. After they were safely back in Aoni, a meeting of the palace council was held, with Cerulean, Idra and Mina in attendance. Florine revealed Cerulean and Mina's identities, and insisted that Mina was welcomed back to the castle and recognised as princess. The council discussed what to do about the treatment Florine received in the captured Laguna Palace and the Aoni guards who were still imprisoned there. They sent a messenger and, while waiting, visited the courts of two nearby kingdoms, where both Florine and Mina received offers of marriage. Back in Alni, a message returned from Laguna, signed by Cerulean's cousin, Kyril, and the Merchants Guild of Laguna, demanding payment for the release of her men. After the guards returned safely, Cerulean formally proposed to Florine, and she accepted. When this was announced at the council, several, including Hortense and Delis, advised against announcing this publicly. Instead, they should have a private ceremony and tell the people that a public celebration would come later. But Florine, in an unusually direct way, insisted that they be open about it. The people would understand. As it happened, when the wedding was announced, and with it the revelation that the queen would marry the king of Laguna, cursed in the form of a bird, the kingdom buzzed with curiosity. For many, the romance of the situation, devotion despite the curse, filled them with even greater admiration and affection for their sovereign. Others, who were more superstitious, feared that marrying a cursed king would be an omen. And in the weeks leading up to the wedding, the news that King Cerulean had lost his throne had also spread to and throughout the Garden Kingdom. But on the day itself, with the customary parades and parties, with traditional delicacies flavoured with rose, violet, lavender, or other edible flowers and herbs, were baked and shared across the capital. Those who lived in the hinterlands and farmlands outside of the city, for the most part made their way there too, to join the festivities. The wedding vows were held in the open, in the largest public garden in the city, in a white oak pavilion, an island in a sea of colourful flowers. The people looked on in fascinated silence as their queen exchanged her vows with the exquisite blue bird, sitting atop a wooden perch, intricately carved with flowers and gilt with silver. A truly memorable day. Out of respect for Cerulean, who, in other circumstances, would have taken Florine to be queen of Laguna, and had been cursed due to his steadfast faithfulness to her, rather than the usual title of Prince Consort for a man who marries a queen, Florine declared that he was still to be called King Cerulean. The Council of Alni, whatever misgivings they had about the marriage, recognised Cerulean's noble character and sound judgement, and he was, in effect, truly governing in partnership with his dear wife. Months passed. The king and queen were inseparable. Idro searched relentlessly for some other way to end the curse, often travelling to libraries and other kingdoms or visiting one of the few other magicians in all manner of places. But again and again, he came up empty. Meanwhile, along with the princes from Fidela and Hikosh, a steady stream of suitors visited the palace with the aim of wooing Mina. She now felt quite overwhelmed with choices. But at the same time, on some level, she hated that she had had to become beautiful to be loved. A little envious of the purity of her sisters and Cerulean's love, despite his curse, she found herself longing for a rare sort of man who could love her in the same way. But this feeling gave her a sorrowful look that made her beauty even more powerful, and she felt somehow that she was now under the grip of a different curse. When she was not meeting with suitors, the princess spent much of her time in the royal gardens, sitting, looking at the flowers or talking with old Hortense. But time went on, and she had still met no king or prince whom her heart could trust. One day, there began a change of fortunes for all of them, when a small attachment of soldiers arrived from Laguna, bringing with them a gravely ill man. It was Chiral, Cerulean's cousin. 
he was feverish and weak. They were welcomed inside the castle, where Chiral was taken to a bed, and Helos called for. The soldiers had been guards loyal to Chiral's family before he had taken the throne. They explained that Chiral had been poisoned, almost certainly by the Merchants' Guild, who, with Tresio as their proxy, now had Laguna fully in their grasp. It appeared that the dosage of the poison was not sufficient to kill him instantly. The Lagunan lord had been in and out of consciousness, but fearing that his family home was also unsafe, he had told his guards to bring him to Alni. Idro, hearing their story, knew that Cerulean's cousin would have been counting on the good nature that the bird king had inherited so thoroughly from his father. Cerulean would not abandon his cousin, despite his treachery. As a precaution, Cerulean, gaining the agreement of the council and the queen, ordered that the merchants' guild be expelled from Alni. The merchants, of course, complained vociferously, but with the encouragement of the Alnian soldiers, they indeed left. This spread an air of uncertainty, but also relief among the people, especially those who were in debt or had been stuck in unfavourable contracts. It would prevent trade with the majority of the other kingdoms, apart from the cows, but in their case, their hunter-gatherer way of life did not generally produce a surplus that could be traded, and they had little interest in it anyway. Instead, the Aonian council, especially with the guidance of Idro and Hortense, began to liaise with the farmers and tradespeople of the kingdom to establish Aoni's capacity to feed itself, and to ensure that, now that coinage had effectively lost its value, all would feel suitably compensated for their work. Despite the loss of certain ingredients, delicacies, fabrics or the like, that had become commonplace, all in all, the relative isolation of the kingdom fostered a patriotic and content mood. The Aonian healers treated Chiral with their herbs, and his condition had stabilised to some degree. But, it turned out, he had all but lost his sight. The world was a blur to him. Then, one evening, he was taken to the royal gardens by a servant. Mina saw him there, seeing the resemblance with Cerulean, but with sharper features and a dark look in his blinded eyes. She came over to sit and talk to him, dismissing the servant. And in the following weeks, they often spent time together talking. The healers of Alni tried what they could to restore Chiral's sight, but to no avail. As Cerulean learned of this, he asked Idro if there was anything he could do for his cousin. To this, the old magician responded that even if he could, was Cerulean really sure that he should? Having lost his sight, Chiral's treacherous nature was contained. In response, Cerulean said, If you can heal him, do so. But Idro shook his head, having hoped that the king would not have insisted. Master Idro! The bird king's voice took on an unusual quality when he raised it. Forgive me, my lord, replied Idro, but I will not. Again, Cerulean said firmly, Idro, you are sworn to my blood. Do as I say but Idro just bowed and left the room. Following that, he disappeared from the castle. Later, when Cerulean spoke to Mina, he told her that the magician could not help Kyril. He did not share Idro's precise words regarding his cousin. The princess was crestfallen, but she knew there was someone else she could ask, though she was afraid to do so. Her godmother, Susie.